Okay, this week, oh, I'm so excited for this. So I told you, remember, I told you, there were two kinds of speakers I want you to get exposure to. Number one, an actual college graduate from this course, this program, Niagara College Business, whoop, 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 right? This program, a graduate, like someone who was in your chair, like just a few years ago. And in a moment, we'll say, we'll kind of figure it was a little more than a few years ago because I'm we're dating ourselves. Uh, and secondly, someone who actually does marketing for a living. <laughs> so today, uh, joining me, so excited, uh, Michelle Kahn. That is her married name. She just got married. So everybody, round of applause. Woo! And then, of course, on the screen is Michelle Sear, who was the, the, her name when she went through the program. And we just a little bit of reminiscing. And Michelle and I were in our class together in 2013. Like, oh, my gosh. I thought it was like two years ago. <laughs> I thought it was like two years ago. That's wild. So, uh, Michelle, I'm going to give you an opportunity to kind of give a bit of your background. Um, I will tell you the students this year that we have in Principles of Marketing, uh, Marketing 1301, great, great people, intelligent, very committed, global, like we're around the globe. It, it's been a little bit of a challenge, as I'm sure you can face as well with our virtual world. It's we're doing our classes on Fridays virtually. And it's not the same as when, you know, you and I were flipping tables and running around the room. Uh, but um, that's kind of our world right now. Our hope is, at our hope, I hate that word, but after the March break, we're actually going to get these students back in a classroom with parachutes, seat belts, safety helmets, and we're going to be ready to go. So what I would like you to do, Michelle, Michelle, uh, like tell us your story. Kind of tell us the journey that you've taken, you know, take us through your college experience and working with this big doof. But, you know, kind of let's let's walk through kind of where you were when you're at the college and then kind of walk through your experience. And then, of course, where you are now as a very young and polished professional. And I get very emotional because we were just kids when we worked together. Well, you were. Yeah. I, wasn't, but. I know it doesn't feel like long ago at all, but. Um, so I graduated from the Niagara College uh, Business Sales and Marketing Program, like you said, in 2013. It was a great program. I loved it. And it really made me certain that it was the right industry for me. Um, but upon graduating, I was hit in the face with the unfortunate reality that the pickings are very slim for recent graduates with little experience like myself. Yeah. I did, however, do two things as a student that I have zero regrets about. The first thing was that I decided to extend my, int my internship for several extra months. The, the program still has an internship with it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Not, I don't know if all the students are doing it, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Well, I had the opportunity to do an internship and I extended it for several extra months. Um, and I was interning as an unpaid social media coordinator for WP Creations, which was a company with 40 franchises across Canada. Um, and they made molds and castings of children's hands and feet to put into shadow boxes as like memory keepsakes. Yeah. Super random, but it was a great opportunity. Yeah. At the time, I was a 21, uh, a 21 year old, no kids. And I was very, very far from their target market, which was the mom community. And it was my first opportunity to put myself into a client's shoes and create engaging content for a community that I was in no way a part of. Um, the owner was such a wonderful person. I was super lucky to have this opportunity with her. Um, she included me on all of their uh, monthly webinars with their franchisees, um, where I gave short presentations with, with tips to the owners who are managing their own social media pages. And she also took me on all of her business conferences uh, during my term, which is where I had my first crack at networking, which can be a very intimidating thing at first, because we're told our whole lives not to talk to strangers, and then we just <laughs> throw it all out the window. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we kind of drilled that home in our class, right? Like, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, then my sec the second thing that I did that I didn't have any regrets about kind of gave me my advantage was during my time as a student, I was working as a server in a luxury retirement home. Mm. And I had been there for several years. And I had a really great relationship with the management team there. So I had this bright idea to ask the sales and marketing director if I could shadow her a few times a week. 
And my intention there was just to sit and watch a marketing professional in the, in real life, in the flesh. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. And after a few weeks, I ended up doing cold calls and I ended up booking tours for her for potential residents. Um, and I worked for free, which wasn't ideal. But at the end of the day, it was an opportunity to gain experience. Yeah. You know, when I was in a position where it like that was my only option, really. Um, and I earned myself a reference uh, for future job opportunities. Right. So with that little bit of experience from those two opportunities, graduation came along and I had to start thinking about my career debut. So I was searching job boards, LinkedIn, I was searching company career websites, and I was applying left, right, and center for marketing specific positions. And okay. I had no luck. Mm. So I started broadening my search and I became open to applying to sales positions, um, which wasn't my first pick, but it was, you know, it was, it would do for the time being. It's the entry point. Yeah, exactly. So I ended up landing a sales position in a reservation center for one of Canada's largest entertainment resorts, resorts with, which just happened to be based in the Niagara Falls Tourism District. Oh. And again, it wasn't my first choice, but I had to start somewhere. Yeah. Which leads me to a very important thought. It is so important that whatever the hell you're doing, you are giving it your all. Like be the best at whatever you're doing. Like if you're flipping burgers, be the Wayne Gretzky of burger flipping. If you're scooping ice cream scoop like you've never scooped before, because you know why? One thing usually leads to another, which is exactly what happened to me in this dang call center <laughs> position. Fast forward two months, I got a call from our department manager yeah. and uh, she knew that I had recently graduated from the sales and marketing program at Niagara and a position in their marketing department had just opened up. So she was calling me to see if I was interested in an interview. So I was obviously super, super pumped and I jumped on the opportunity and I was so thankful that she vouched for me because um, I had been working for her for a couple months and I've right. been performing. And so I go to the interview and of course I sold myself like my life depended on it. <laughs> I displayed my portfolio uh, that featured work samples from school, um, from my internship. I had my, tr my student transcript in there. Yeah. Um, I had a handful of testimonials just from people I worked with who, right. you know, just talked about my character overall, since I, I didn't really have that much experience in the marketing world. Yeah. And come to think of it, I'm pretty sure I printed off your recommendation on LinkedIn, Neil, and had that one on a page. Yeah. <laughs> And when and then, we did that, remember we did that in class about one of our assignments was create a resume, but make mm -hmm. it a package. You didn't have a lot of experience, but you had kind of the, your, your, your portfolio of your work. You were on LinkedIn. You had some references. Yeah. You, you were building mm -hmm. your package. Absolutely. So I ended up getting the job and I'll Ooh. forever be thankful that they saw my ambition and my willingness to learn. That was Number one, I like you can't lie about the fact that you don't have a lot of experience, but you have to be adamant that you're you're so ready to learn like you're, you know, have a passion to learn to get on board to, you know, jump in feet first. So, so I got the job and it was amazing and holy smokes, did I learn a lot in this position. It was a marketing coordinator for for this. Um, it was uh, one of Canada's largest entertainment complexes in Niagara Falls. Yeah. And I wore so many hats in this marketing coordinator role. I, I learned how to produce marketing collateral, everything from hotel room directories to brochures to rack cards. Nice. I, I learned how to measure success of our ad campaigns. I, I nerded out in Excel. I love Excel. And I had the opportunity to create all these revenue reports, production lists for keeping wow. our team on track. It was great. I was the Jill of all trades in this department. Yeah. And, um, and it was a great opportunity for me to learn my strengths and weaknesses and uncover the areas of marketing that I loved most, which in the end ended up being on the digital side of the spectrum when it comes to marketing. So that's where form and effect comes in, which is- the And this is where you are now. Yes, that's where I'm at now. And form um, and effect is a local web-based marketing firm on St. Paul and St. Catharines. Correct. Um, so through, while I was in my marketing coordinator role, I was just randomly browsing the internet one day and I came across a piece of form and effects work. It was actually uh, Ravine Vineyard's website. Yeah. And I thought it was a killer website. And I, I, it sent me down a rabbit hole and I started exploring all the work that they have done. And I really, really admired their creativity and their work culture. Yeah. And so I followed them on Instagram because I wanted to be like them, you know, hashtag goals. 
Hashtag Brent, yeah, Brent and the whole yeah, I, I, you know, those are the kind of prospects. You just like you love them, you start following them. Yeah. So a few years later, I come across a post that said they were hiring a digital marketing manager. And cue the imposter syndrome. A shameful rush of self self-doubt kicked in. And I thought, holy shit, there's no way I can join their team. There's no way I could perform up to their standards. Yeah. But five minutes, five minutes passed, and my imagination was running wild about how fulfilled I would feel working for a company that pumps out such great work. So, and and all the mentors I have there. And so I applied because what's the worst that can happen, right? So I was called in for an interview and I showed up with a box of Beachwood donuts because a wise ah. prof once told me to never show up empty handed. Cross the road. <laughs> it's cross the road. Exactly. And I, you know what? I went back and forth. I'm like, is it too much? Does it gonna, is it gonna seem like a bribe? But I was like, who cares? Everyone likes Beachwood donuts. donuts. They're the best on the planet. <laughs> And so um, by this time, by the time of my interview, I had developed a much larger portfolio. Yeah. And instead of just putting everything in a binder and plopping it down on a table, I actually went more digital with it. And I created a Prezi presentation because yeah. you know, you got to stand out somewhere. Yeah. And I ended up getting the job and I have not looked back. I've been, I've been here for, uh, it was three years in November and it's led me to so many fun, creative, inspiring projects and a hell lot of a professional growth. Wow. So that's my journey from graduation to now. Oh my gosh. And do you remember yeah. who, do you remember who interviewed you at Form and Effect? Yeah, Paul and Brent. Paul, Paul, Paul yeah. and Brent. So the two yeah. so you walked in with the two owners. And these are two guys with totally different personalities. Very much so. Yeah. Brent will just the guy will be climbing on furniture and then Paul yeah. probably just sitting there very Paul, quiet. More like reserved and like asks the questions and like he's more mysterious but the two of them are like a dynamic duo they're great well uh, so yeah. based on that michelle like you've been there now you kind of know the role and you know congratulations because you know that's almost like an ideal career path mm -hmm. the one thing i really respect is that you were prepared to to work for free and you know my my goal is to get internships that are paid but every once in a while you, you, don't underestimate you're always on stage. You're always being watched. Mm -hmm. Now that you've been kind of in the role a little bit, like what's a typical day look like for you? And what would you say is kind of the importance of what you do in marketing as a whole? Like how, how what would you describe? Well, it's a lot different now than it used to be. We used to be, when I first got the job, we had the office down on St. Paul Street. I don't know. Have you ever been in there? Oh yeah. The, that, the, okay. Jessica's dog, the big great Dane was always in there. And yeah. Oh yeah. She, so it was a big open office. There was a table down the center of it and we were open. Like it was, it was a, you know, we were all in the same room. There was no specific like different offices. It was just open concept. Right. And it was a very um, like teamwork environment. Yeah. And, you know, our, our walls were whiteboards. Like we had, if you needed to talk about a client you were working on, you're like, all right, team, let's move to the orange couches. Like we got to talk about something. We got to brainstorm. And that was really great. Nowadays it is, it's, it's different because we're virtual and we've decided to go virtual permanently. But in, in reality, it's just as easy as it was before because you can jump on a conference call equally as easy, you know? Sure. Yeah. And it's, it's just having that, not the guts, but just having, not being afraid to ask for help and just saying like, hey, everyone, I'm kind of stuck. Do you mind if we hop on a call and like quickly brainstorm something, you know? And, wow. and everyone kind of throws out their ideas and there's no bad ideas because sometimes even if your idea isn't the greatest, it might lead someone else to another thought. So, right. you know, it's, that's key is just being open and, and constantly just thinking of different ideas and not being afraid to voice them. Wow. What's yeah. the lion's share of work that you do, Michelle? Pardon? What's the most of the work that you do? Like what, where do you find yourself helping clients? So I specialize in uh, social media marketing. Um, so I do a lot of digital ad campaigns. Um, and yeah, that's like, and I mean, we all kind of, we wear different hats. I also do a lot of copywriting and email marketing. Wow. Um, but, and we share a lot of roles as well. Like if someone is just, you know, has a lot on their plate, sometimes someone else will take it over. So yeah, it's really great. Um, so, go ahead, Michelle, please. I just wanted to back up a tiny bit and just talk about imposter syndrome for a second, because that is so huge. 
And so I just want to say imposter syndrome is loosely defined as doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud. And in my opinion, individuals working in the creative industry are so vulnerable to this mindset because there, there's a lot of pressure to perform and, and come up with killer ideas. And you're often, often surrounded by people who make it look so easy. <laughs> And it's, it's not, it doesn't come easy to everyone. Yeah. And if you haven't experienced imposter syndrome before, I hope you never do, but it's a feeling that usually manifests inside us at some point or another. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways to kick it in different ways, you know, might work for different people. But for me, um, one of the ways is just changing the narrative in my head and not being so hard on myself. So, you know, asking yourself, would I speak to one of my dearest friends in the same way that I'm speaking to myself right now? you know, not being so, so like, you know, why can't I come up with this idea? Why, like, why can't I find a way around this? Like, just stop being so hard on yourself. Right. Number two is focusing on your strengths. So just because you fall short in one area, doesn't mean that you're not top dog in another area. Yeah. Another one is embracing your failures and learning from them because not everything goes as planned. Sometimes things don't work out. Don't dwell on them, learn from them and move on. Like it's, you know, so those are three that work for me, but imposter syndrome is, is real. And it is, it's a block. Cause like, if I would have just, you know, like buried myself in that self self doubt yeah. back when I saw that form and effect ad, I would still be at my old job. You know what I mean? You got to take the dive sometimes and just believe in yourself. Well, please, please rest assured that we all face it. I faced it mm -hmm. many, many times over my career. And I still do, you know, mm -hmm. to the extent where, the strategies that you offer are really sound pieces of advice. And remember back when you were 19, 20 years old in, you know, in Niagara College, you didn't know who would have thought you'd be on this call. Like who would have thought you, you, you'd come this far, uh, mm -hmm. but you just kind of, you just put your head down and kept busy, right? Yep, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Um, yeah. What would, like, what are, what are some different ways and different strategies that you kind of walk through when you're doing kind of di digital campaigns and stuff? What, what tools do you use? Um, so we, there's, I mean, the digital world has so many different tools in terms of marketing, but I just want to start off with saying that sometimes the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing at all. Consumers, know that marketing is everywhere and it influences our purchases, our choices, our lifestyles. And a lot of it is obvious, but some marketing efforts are invisible, meaning that the average person doesn't really realize that it's a marketing piece. That being said, like we were discussing before, the pandemic has posed a lot of interesting challenges and we've had to forget everything that made sense before COVID because our world's been flipped upside down and we've had to take some real creative approaches to getting the results we're aiming for under the current circumstances because client, clients are facing budget cuts, yeah. operational restrictions, and most importantly, in my opinion, is a lack of in-person event opportunities. It's true, yeah. So all of those things have really affected the strategies and tools that we use to market. Um, so I can share a couple of my favorite pieces that we've done mm -hmm. since the beginning of the pandemic because I think that's probably the most effective way to get my like thoughts across. <laughs> um, so the Penn Center is one of our lovely clients. Um, and we had partnered with, or they had partnered with the Education Foundation of Niagara. So that's right. the EFN for short. Yeah. And they had partnered with them on their Porta Backyarda fundraiser campaign. Mm -hmm. The EFN had these bougie sheds made up. You might have seen them inside the Penn Center. When we walked through, yeah, I loved them. It was like one was called the Oasis, and one was called the Man Cave, and they were decked out in the nicest furniture. They had TVs, beautiful interior decor. One of them even had a mini bar with like the taps and everything. It was awesome. I might have, I might have stood in one. I might have walked. Right? Yeah. Oh, they're they were wicked. Anyways, so they were worth $40,000 and the EFN was selling tickets to the public for a chance to win one of these, these sheds for someone's backyard. And so the Penn Center partnered with them and allowed them to put up these sheds in the, in the inside of the mall on display. And the idea, the intention was to have a volunteer that would be there during mall hours and would be selling tickets and promoting the, the campaign to all the foot traffic that thousands of people that came through the mall every day, but then boom, the pandemic hits. Yeah. <laughs> and we were not seeing the foot traffic that we had anticipated originally. 
So the Penn Center still wanted to support them. And we kind of had to find a way around it. Like, how are we going to build any kind of hype around this Porta Backyard campaign with the, the lack of people coming into the mall? So we knew that we had to leverage the audience on their Facebook page because they have something like 35,000 followers right. in order to raise some awareness for this in the digital space. So we, what we ended up doing was we planned a free Saturday morning Facebook Live where we had a yoga instructor do a live stream um, inside the Oasis shed. And so at both the beginning and the end of the, the, the yoga flow, um, we had her do a little spiel on both sheds. Nothing that felt too formal, but it was just an awareness piece. And um, it didn't feel like marketing because our audience was watching this yoga live stream and it had some value to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So everyone who had participated in the, the live yoga class had been made casually aware about this Porta Backyard Yard to Draw. So it was a really, you know, you like it wasn't something that you would typically think about, but it was a great opportunity just to showcase something like that in the digital space. That's brilliant. Yeah. A second, a, another example I'm going to give you is um, that this past summer, our team had the pleasure of developing and managing Equestrian Canada's to Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic social media campaign. Yeah. So our number one main focus was to rally Canada in the digital space because it was the first time in 125 years that there were zero spectators attending the Olympics. And so our goal was to make the Canadian equestrian team to walk into the, the competition ring and feel the support of our nation. Wow. So we launched, so we launched, we wanted, you know, overpouring support in the digital space. We, that's what we really wanted to do because we couldn't physically do it this year. Right. Um, so we launched a cheer squad contest where we welcomed Canadians to submit photos using hashtag ride to Tokyo and they could, you know, win a signed t-shirt. Um, and then throughout the games, we shared a lot of fun and interesting facts about the athletes and the horses because we wanted to right. humanize them. We shared things like game time rituals, um, the horses' favorite snacks, because we wanted their audience to feel like they were on a first name basis with the members of the Canadian equestrian team. We wanted their support, yeah. right? Yeah. This so is again, another marketing effort that didn't quite feel like marketing to the average person because it held so much value for the audience and it elevated Equestrian Canada's brand itself. A very organic, so, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, like I said earlier, you've had, we've kind of really had to rethink everything because the pandemic has posed so many challenges for the average client of ours. So, yeah. Wow, you know, and you said something earlier, Michelle, about, you know, the, the pandemic has changed the rules, but the one thing, and even that I've shared with the students and something that I've used is all of the years of branding, being on platforms, writing columns, I just wrote another book for crying out, like just being out there on a constant basis, but also telling great stories. Like yes. there, there's enough critics and cynics and we call, you know, remember the BMWs, the bitchers, moaners and whiners and social media. Yeah, um, they're all like medical experts all of a sudden. But oh, yeah. I've always thought about the importance of sh sharing good stories. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that branding is what I leaned back on during the pandemic, mm -hmm. where I saw a lot of my competitors, quite frankly, disappear. And mm -hmm. now it's it's and people go, how come you're how come you're busy? I think I attribute it to all that work, like you did early in your career. I did all that legwork. Yeah. And you never underestimate it. It, it, it comes back. It's karma. It comes yeah. back to you. Right. Yeah. And story like social media is all about storytelling, right? You want to tell brand stories. You want to, you know, drag mm -hmm. out story too. Like if you can give a story as much legs as it can, you know, like use that leverage that. So absolutely. What would be your favorite marketing book? <laughs> oh, Neil, don't do this to me. Let me think about it. Let uh, me think about out it. Out of nowhere. I like uh, Build a Story Brand by Don Miller. Mm. It's kind of... It, I haven't read that one. Yeah, based on I'm what you just said. Write that down. Yeah, Build a Story Brand, Don Miller. Um, I, I've i always liked that. Uh, I always liked unmarketing, uh, although the, everybody thought it was UN marketing, but unmarketing no. is Scott Stratton. Uh, Unmarketing is a fantastic book. Yeah. Actually, I might I might steal that. I went to a conference and saw Scott Stratton and he was fantastic. Yeah. 
he is great. Um, that might be my favorite. Don Just Miller. Just putting me on the spot, and I can't really. I know. I knew I would. Anything. You knew I would, right? Um, a big part. So we're kind of you're better at this than I am, and that's why I wanted to bring you on here because you're into now like measuring the impact of marketing and. Uh -huh. My, my measurement is never underestimate you're always on stage. And my measurement shows up when I walk into a room and people right. go, I loved when you did that, or I saw that. And to me, that's kind of how I measure, yep. but, you know, from a corporate world, you probably want more tangible measurements than that. Like what are some of the tools that you guys use at form and effect to measure marketing? Well, measuring success in marketing totally depends on what the goals are. Awesome. So when, when we're developing a marketing campaign or any marketing effort for that matter, um, we're, we outline our specific goals. And once we have those goals in place, we can establish a handful of KPIs, which are key performance okay. indicators. Yeah. And we monitor those throughout the duration of the marketing effort. So again, I'll give a couple random scenarios that I can think of. <laughs> so just to give diff examples of different goals and different KPIs. So scenario one, let's say we're selling a thousand, our goal is to sell a thousand concert tickets. What's your favorite band meal? Uh, I like. Yeah, now I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, I'm a bit of a metalhead, So um, I'd probably say rotting Christ, but don't, don't I gotta take that out of there. <laughs> okay. um, all, like all time, you ready? Yes. I saw uh, Iron Maiden open for Judas Priest. Okay, Iron Maiden. That's okay, like scenario one. We're selling, our goal is to sell a thousand Iron Maiden tickets before January 31st. And we blog, we've launched a social media campaign, ad campaign. Let's say that's our, that's our, our scenario one. So not only are we going to be monitoring the obvious metric, which is our ticket sales, we're also going to be monitoring through Google Analytics how much website traffic is coming directly from that ad campaign that we have running. So based on like we'd have a UTM code that we'd be able to track through Google Analytics. So as we would monitor these metrics leading up to the deadline, we can make tweaks and adjustments to the geographic targeting, the ad copy, maybe the graphic creative um, to improve its performance if it wasn't doing well. Wow. So that's one scenario, right? We'd be yeah. monitoring those actual metrics, the clicks all the way through. Right. Now, completely different scenario. Let's say an electrical company is over their head in work and they aren't looking to secure any new contracts, but they want their brand to remain top of mind for local businesses for future B2B opportunities. So let's say we're using organic social media in order to achieve this. Yeah. Maybe we're crafting content that specifically appeals to that target market, or maybe we're engaging with those local businesses directly from their social media account. Whatever it is, our key performance indicator in this scenario would be genuine engagement from those local businesses that we're targeting. So you see what I'm, what I'm saying here? The way you measure success of your marketing efforts completely depends on what those goals are. And because there are so many different ways to measure success in marketing, it's so important as a marketing expert to be well-versed in those common analytical platforms such as Google AdWords and Google Analytics. Yeah. And then the back end of like social media, so like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter analytics. And there are so many resources online to, you know, just crash courses on learning the basics of those platforms as well. So they're definitely worth investing. It, it's great advice because of all the speakers, students, I hope you guys are writing stuff down right now, because all the speakers are giving me different pieces of advice. And that knowing the goals and the key performance indicators, the KPIs, I'm going to expect in their marketing plans in their bigger terms, because their big term project is individually, they're going to do a marketing plan for a business of their choice. So th this week, they're doing a SWOT and an environmental scan for a business of their choice. So that's usually the first step. Then the second step is working with the client and saying, what are your objectives for marketing? Do you want to grow your brand? Do you want to build business development? Like, what are your objectives? What are, what are our indicators? That's cool. I love that. Yeah. So hope yeah. everybody's paying attention. Hope everybody's watched this till the end to this point, because this is the mm -hmm. good stuff. Yeah. Um, Michelle, cl classics. You're a graduate of this program. You're you're now kind of, you're working, you're building a family. I'm so I get emotional about all this stuff. I'm so proud of you. 
What's, like, what's your advice for a student who was in your seat a number of years ago? What would your advice be for them? Okay, so <laughs> I'm, gonna make, I'm gonna say two things. So number one, going back to that imposter syndrome, do not give in to imposter syndrome, whatever way it is, get over it. Like find a way to get past it because if you, if you give in to imposter syndrome, you're done. Um, number two, which is just so important to me is take creative breaks. We've all heard of writer's block, but there's also such thing as creative, cre creative block. My goodness, I'm getting tongue tied. It's so important to walk away from the drawing board from time to time in order to see your work in new light when you come back to it. It can be as simple as going for a half hour walk. That's what I do. I, I go for a walk at lunch. I put on my Crime Junkies uh, podcast and I take my mind off whatever I'm working on because then you come back to it and you feel fresh and you know, you're coming back to it with fresh eyes. Wow. It can be meditating, maybe going and working out. It can even be calling a friend, just taking your mind off whatever you're working on for a decent amount of time. Yeah. Just so that when you end up returning back to your work, you can feel like you're looking at it with fresh eyes and a clear mind. So those are my yeah. two big pieces of advice. As really good advice. Yeah. Awesome. So on behalf of kind of Niagara College, because kind of this is our town, this is, where, this is where we kind of met. And I remember the first day you were in class. I remember it like it was yesterday. And then you guys were like all on your desks. Oh, my the, God. The I was students, don't, know, my... The students oh aren't God. aware of what we do when we get together. But you, I remember walking in the room and you guys were all standing on the desk. You're like, ah, going nuts. And We had to. Was, you think about how that stretched you. You think about yeah. that. That was my Fine. goal. Absolutely. And I've got to thank you for all the valuable advice during the, that term, because it was really what pushed me outside of my comfort zone. And that's, you know, your comfort, going outside your comfort zone is where you grow. And yeah. it, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's where the magic happens. So. Wow. Yeah. All right. So we're going to stay in touch. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go the recording now. Stay on because I'm going to keep okay. on. But uh, hey, students, hope you took lots of notes. Michelle Kahn in the house. Woo -woo. Uh, you're gonna oh Michelle how how do students connect with you uh add me on LinkedIn let's see add, add Michelle on. On. Mm -hmm. and you don't send a generic invitation no I want to see a nice well-written talk about my the video you just watched yeah because I'm not going to know who they are I mean right. they're just going to be strangers to me so make sure you let me know who you are and introduce yourselves and let's connect awesome okay here we go